Hello, BookTube. In the heart of uh, downtown Boston, there is a used bookstore that I go to occasionally <laughs> called the Brattle Bookshop. It's three stories. It's a general, crowded, all-purpose used bookstore on the first two, and then the third floor is harder to find, limited editions, first editions, that sort of thing. And there's also a sale lot next door to the shop. Used bookstores will ordinarily have a barrow or two, or even, in the case of the Strand Bookstore in New York City, ten, that they put outside that have bargain books on them. Usually, I hate to say this about the used bookstores that do it, but usually the books out there are junk. And I don't mean junk in an editorial sense. I mean, they've got mildew on them. They've been, they've been pounded by rain. They're, they're stock that the buyers in the shop have thought, I don't want to sell this in the store. But it's good enough for the for the sale barrows. <laughs> uh, that tends not to be the case with the brattle. The the stock outside is merely excess. Who knows what complicated uh, brattle bookshop algorithm goes into putting stuff out there as opposed to putting it inside the shop. But it's huge. It's not two or five or ten barrows. It's it's thousands and thousands of sale books for a dollar, three dollars, or five dollars. And uh, I skipped the Brattle last week. I usually go fairly often, but I skipped it last week and went first thing this morning because Boston is in the middle of a, a, a trough of fairly mild weather. Going to the Brattle first thing in the morning, capping off my morning errands by going to the sale lot when it's 20 degrees or 20 below zero, <laughs> that can test the faithful. I've done it. I have shopped in the Brattle sale lot outside in literally all weathers, except pouring rain when they don't have the books out there. But uh, I prefer it when it's a little milder. <laughs> it's less distracting for paying attention to the books. And oh my, the books. First of all, they change all the time. The stock inside the shop and out in the sale lot changes all the time. And second, there's no organization except by price. So if you are of a mind frame to... If you're a bookish person and you want to cure whatever ails you and just go lose yourself in a wilderness of books, it's the perfect place to do that. The sale lot is the perfect place to do that. I'm sure that you're that you're like me in that if you go to a huge used bookstore, one of the things your brain will start to do will just be to look at whole sections and write them off. Okay, well, this is, speaking of the Strand, for instance... I am pretty sure that in the hundreds of times that I've been there, I have never actually gone into the long aisle of sports, of books about sports. I'm pretty sure that I've never even walked into that aisle. Your brain just does that, but there's no way to do that in the sale lot because the books aren't organized in any way. So you just become, you just be, you're just taken out of yourself and put into browsing the books, which has an extra element for me of fulfillment. It's one of the reasons why I've used the Brattle sale lot to cure myself of some legitimately harsh doldrums in my life, dark times in my life. I use it, I have used it in the past to cure myself of that because in addition to not knowing what I'm going to expect in the sale lot, I also know what I'm going to expect. I am old friends with a lot of these books I have seen in my life a lot of books <laughs> and seeing them or uh, uh, seeing a cover or a design or a particular edition that I haven't seen in 50 years is wonderful. Seeing something that I haven't seen in 20 years or 10 years and haven't thought about is wonderful regardless of what I pick out to buy. So I went to the Brattle first thing this morning. I got into the neighborhood right around the dog walking hour. There were lots of people out with their dogs. So that was a lot of fun on its own. Uh, I have a dog right now who reads the riot act of the dog. She's not aggressive. Uh, I, other dogs couldn't approach us when I had my, my pointer mailing. I could just look at them from afar, but they couldn't they couldn't come close. She was she was aggressive towards other dogs. Frida is not, but she's so fussy. <laughs> just a gigantic exclamation point. And it tends to put dogs back on their you know on their hackles just a bit. They they tend to say, well, what's this? A few of the dogs in the neighborhood know. They can just ignore her. She's just fussy. <laughs> and that, that never causes any problem. So we get to, to spend time together. But when she's not with me, she wasn't with me first thing this morning. So I was able to just walk up to all these babies on my own, including one pair that was being walked together. Big, floofy dogs. Just 
60 pound dogs that have long hair, floofy faces, big dust cloud tails, and, and that are the soul of love. They just love everyone. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And then I got to the shop. And I browsed around. I said hi to everybody, met a new employee, met all the old employees, talked my talked to my heart's content, asked tons of questions, always something interesting going on at the Brattle. And I browsed a lot, and I got a pile of books. Even though I am uh, decreasing my books, I am minimizing my books, I still got a crowd of books. Who knows how many of them I'll keep? That's That's definitely the excuse. That's the way that I'm looking at these things, is that they could be in today and gone in a month. I, they're just of interest to me now. I will read all of these things, especially in later in December when I'm not reading new releases. I'll read all of them, but I doubt that I'll keep all of them. So I, it's not a question of me overloading my shelves. Although yesterday I realized with a tiny bit of book reorganization that I have here four completely empty bookcases. So I wouldn't be in danger of overloading my shelves anyway. Uh, I got a pile of books and... Then I had a great time, talked to everybody, and then my day went off a cliff. It wasn't gradual, and it wasn't partial. <laughs> it went off a cliff. This was hours ago, and I'm still psychically smarting from the whole experience. Everything after that moment, after I said, bye, everybody, after that moment, everything that could go wrong went wrong. One thing after another, after another, after another, until all I wanted in the whole world was to get back here and then never leave the house again except to walk the dog. Right now, hours and hours later, half a day later, that is still my intention. Never to go out into the world again. I know that's insane. I just caught a bad break. That's all. I've been out in the wide world many, 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 many times in 2022 alone and haven't caught a bad break. Had interesting experiences. I know that it's an overreaction. I'm going with it for now rather than do any kind of, hey, be sensible. I don't feel like being sensible. Not when a day gangs up on me like the one did today. I had a whole bunch of things that I had scheduled for the day, assuming that the day that my outside world errands would behave and that I would come back here at a reasonable time. I had a whole bunch of things planned. I had all sorts of, of uh, Zoom calls and editor conferences and whatnot. None of it. I, I one by one, just consecutively had to say, this isn't going to work. No sense postponing it. It's just not going to work. I, the whole day has to just be wiped out because of what's happening to me. One thing after another. <sighs> Eventually, I did get back here. And cleaned myself up, calmed myself down, walked with my baby out in the woods and fields where there is no human agitation at all. Not at all. Where we were disturbing squirrels because they were looking for food or looking not to be food. Where we were walking with no one else around. Nothing. No dogs, no humans, nobody. Just the two of us in perfect contentment. My tiny, tiny little dog and me. That helped a lot. And then I did a bunch of reading. I said, screw it. The whole day is, is done anyway, so don't even bother taking out any kind of thing to write on. Just read. Read until you recalibrate. And that has largely happened. Then I realized one other thing that always helps me recalibrate is talking to my imaginary booktube friends. <laughs> talking to you. And I have the perfect excuse. We have a brattle hall to go through. So we'll do that. And hope that it makes me feel even better. So let's start off with the uh, with the mass market paperbacks. There's, for instance, a Sherlock Holmes pastiche novel by the science fiction author uh, Philippe Jose Farmer, who did the Riverworld books and the World of Tear and whatnot. A World of Tears. I like him very much. I like Farmer very much, and he loved the Conan Doyle canon, and he wrote at least one Sherlock Holmes story that I have read, and I have it as an ebook. But to put it mildly, the ebook cover, it's a redesign for, that was done a few years ago. The ebook cover does not match the mass market that I found today. This is the adventure of the peerless peer. How is that for a cover? <laughs> you have Watson and that's the Nigel Bruce Watson, and you have Holmes and you have Tarzan. 
of the apes and a dirigible, <laughs> a German dirigible. It's a tiny little thing. Somebody put a, uh, a plastic covering over it and uh, included a little note with a price tag of $12.50. This cost me a dollar, so it did not cost me $12.50. But the little note is, uh, DeWall refers to this edition as revised, but except for the editor's comments at the end, there is no indication of revision. Uh, I haven't read this in a long, long time. The copy that I had did not look like this, the paperback copy that I had originally. I have an e-copy that I did, I've never got around to. It was part of a reissue, a whole series of Sherlock Holmes pastiche novels. I have all of those e-books. I have all of those Holmes adventures as e-books. And I've read, reread or read a few of them, but I never got around to this one. Then all of a sudden I saw this at the shop. This is, this is Sherlock Holmes uh, and Dr. Watson in 1916, I think, teaming up with Lord Greystoke, with Tarzan. I seem to remember, oh, there's, the, there's, there's a little cheetah reading an account. I seem to remember this being kind of dumb uh, in a fun kind of way, where it's not particularly faithful to Tarzan, even though Philippe Jose Varmer literally wrote the book on Tarzan. He wrote a book called Tarzan Alive that I'd recommend to any Edgar Rice Burroughs fan. Uh, and despite the fact that it's not all that faithful to Holmes and Watson either. Uh, as you as you can sort of tell, although of course the art the author had no control over the art, you can sort of get a hint of that from the cover. If you see if you see Holmes with a gigantic you know uh, ornate pipe and a deerstalker cap, you know you're dealing with with a character of Holmes, but not Holmes himself, who virtually never in the canonical stories wears such a cartoonish getup. That's a, a function of later media interpretation. Same thing with the dumb Colonel Blimpish Watson. That also is, that is Nigel Bruce. That is Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. That is, Watson in the stories is not a, a dumb oaf. He's not a, a doofus. So <laughs> we will see. I, we will see. I haven't reread this in quite some time. Uh, then this next one, uh, the, the booktube gods were listening. I mentioned on, uh, what was it? The, I think it was a Steve stream. Uh, well, it was a video recently, this week, I mentioned that, uh, that I love the Canadian historian Peter R. Burton, but I don't have anything by him. No ebooks and no print books of any kind. And the Brattle provided, I, I found a copy of Niagara, which I haven't ever read. A big sprawling history of the, the men and women who pioneered the, the white men and women, the settler women, men and women who pioneered N Niagara and learned about it. I also, very intriguing to me, I noticed that this book has a large amount of the natural history of the whole water system. And that will fascinate me a lot more than the miscellaneous beaver trappers that Pierre Burton has a weird soft spot for. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I haven't, a Pierre Burton that I haven't read. I know there's a lot of that. I've read a lot of this author, but I haven't read everything. And I know that there's plenty that maybe is a little bit too Canadian centric so that maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't care all that much about it. But this one, very much so. Uh, and I, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Niagara Falls. It's an amazing experience to go to Niagara Falls. Uh, then I found a, uh, a mass market classic. I have a whole couple of shelves in the little book room of mass market classics. So if I find one, I really don't pass up much if it's in good condition. I've had this one before. This is the David Luke translation of Tonio Kruger <laughs> and and other stories by Thomas Mann. And this is his this is Mann's very earliest creative period. The 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 title story is brilliant and it was written when Mann was little more than a boy. I know that's hard to believe. It's hard to think of him that way, but he was in his twenties, his early twenties when he wrote it. And you'd never know. You'd never know at all. This uh, Tonio <laughs> Uh, and other stories is kind of his Dubliners, only in his case, with talent. <laughs> so I didn't have this. I, I mean, I had this mass market paperback decades ago. Haven't had it since. So I grabbed it again. These were all. Uh, I think most of these were a dollar, and it didn't matter anyway because thanks to uh, uh, store credit, I wasn't I wasn't paying any money out of pocket here. Then this next one, not in very good condition. I can reinforce it. I grabbed it just because it was cheap and I don't have it. And I have had it in the past. This is P.G. Woodhouse. This is Jeeves and the Tie That Binds, uh, which had uh, a 
different title in the UK. I think this was much obliged Jeeves in the UK. And this is a, a very late Jeeves and Worcester story. Now, Jeeves and Worcester, the, for those of you who don't know, these, these are P.G. Woodhouse's signature stories about uh, a flighty, over-moneyed, undersensed young man in a, a vaguely pre-World War era, uh, a vaguely Edwardian era, uh, called Bertie Worcester who, as far as fans have been able to determine, is probably the younger son of a nobleman. So he gets a very generous allowance, but he doesn't have to do anything or be anything. And he isn't. He's an idiot. <laughs> Fortunately. Uh, and so are all of his friends. Most of them. Most of his friends are also flighty society idiots. Fortunately, early on, he gets paired up with uh, a valet to beat all valets. <laughs> he gets paired up with Jeeves, who is all-knowing, Who's, whose brow is extra big because he eats lots of fish. <laughs> He's, he, he, Jeeves is there to solve Bertie's problems and the problems of his friends. Uh, and it was a winning combination. And so Woodhouse just kept writing those stories and the same characters pop in and out of all these stories. Bertie Worcester has a coterie of aunts that he views as uh, horrific beings calling to each other like brontosauruses across a primordial swamp. <laughs> Or they are they it, they always seem so sweet and innocent, and then out pops the cloven hoof. <laughs> His aunt Dahlia is uh, the nice one. His aunt Agatha is the horrifying one. They they live in places like Totley Towers or uh, or Market Snodsbury, and there's there's always trouble brewing somewhere, usually revolving around whether or not Bertie Wooster is going to be led down the aisle by one of the many nubile and and marriage-minded young women that he happens to know. In this book, if memory serves, and in this case, it's not my advanced age, it's that anybody could get these stories mixed up. Really, they could. That's part of the joy of them, believe it or not. I believe that in this story, it's once again Madeline Bassett, who is uh, beautiful, pin-up territory, we're called, but Daffy, even by Bertie Wooster's standards, she thinks that the stars are God's daisy chain, and that every time a fairy blows its nose, a baby is born. <laughs> things like that and i if i remember correctly from this book she was happily engaged to gussie fink noddle so that birdie was off the hook then gussie runs away with a servant and madeline bassett is suddenly has her sights fixed on birdie again until in swoops swoops uh roderick spode who is a, a kind of a kind of uh it's woodhouse's lampooning of the brown shirts and the the fascist movement and Spode is his, is his lampooning of the kind of stupid strongman that tends to lead those kind of movements. Very, very funny stuff. And the remarkable thing about Jeeves and the Ties That Bind is that this was written when Woodhouse was 90. He just kept writing. Woodhouse did. He, he just kept writing. In fact, he wrote a book called Woodhouse Writes to the End. He just kept writing. Just book after book after book after book after book got up, sat at his manual typewriter, and just kept pounding away. And uh, that makes this interesting because you automatically want to look at it and see, are there any changes? Are, does, it, does it suffer? Is it worse? I think probably if you were going to be uncharitable, you would say that it is, that you can sort of see the seams a bit, even though there are a couple of, of wonderful twists and turns in this particular story. This particular story revolves around a whole bunch of trouble that is caused because of a mishap at the Junior Ganymede Club. <laughs> it's a club of valets that Jeeves is a member of. All the, all the valets to all the promising young men belong to this club together, this private club. And one of the things they do, disastrously, is that they keep a big club book in which they are all obliged to write down everything that they know about their employers. All the peccadillos, all the faults, all the foibles and quirks, so that each one of them knows what they might be getting into if they're hired to be the valet for that person. Bertie Worcester has several pages in the, in the Junior Gaining Mead book, and so do a whole bunch of other people. And one, a, a kind of rogue valet, a kind of rogue gentleman's gentleman, steals the book. So there's all kinds of trouble here. And in the course of that trouble, the one really notable thing about this Jeeves and Worcester story is revealed, which is Jeeves' first name. <laughs> which in 90 years Woodhouse had not given him a first name so that to sort of uh, to sort of increase the aura of mystique 
I will reread this. I don't think this particular paperback is already sort of discoloring. I don't think this will take more than one reread. -read. I have all of these on ebooks, but I have a soft spot for these old paperbacks. I find that when I find them for cheap, I get them. Uh, and that's it for the uh, mass market paperbacks, but the next one is also a soft spot, a decided soft spot. You never know what you're going to find out in the Brattle sale a lot. You never know what's going to crop up. A lot of times it will be whole blocks of things that somebody sold to the Brattle. They decided the whole block is going out to the sale a lot, so the whole block shows up out there. Sometimes you get lucky with that, sometimes you don't. There were, for instance, there was a huge block of old popular mechanics magazines out there from like the 50s and 60s. I uh, don't know why anybody would want those, but somebody, if somebody does, they're going to think they died and went to heaven to, to find these things for a dollar apiece. And that was true this morning. One thing I noticed out in the sale lot that hadn't been there before was Loeb Classical Library editions. A huge number of them. Older Loeb Classical Library editions, which is, uh, those of you who don't know, Harvard University Press puts out a series of little hardcover editions of the classics of ancient Greece and Rome. The Greek volumes are green, the Roman volumes are red, and the books are split. You get the Greek and the Latin on one side, and the Eng an English translation, sometimes good, on the other side. Minimal editorial interference. They're mainly meant for students of the language, I would think. They're mainly meant to, so that you can just follow along with the language as a trot, in a, in a way. Uh, they can be very entertaining. The Loeb Classical Libraries can be very entertaining, and they are regularly updated. We've seen plenty of new Loeb's on this channel. Uh, there were a ton of them there today for somebody somebody who wants a whole an almost whole it wasn't complete i checked it wasn't complete and it certainly isn't complete now because i did my bit <laughs> but uh somebody wants lots and lots of lobes if you went lobes tend to be expensive the new ones tend to be expensive where you get three for a hundred dollars maybe if you went to the, to the brattle now you you a hundred dollars would get you a whole box full of, of low Picasso libraries, depending on which ones you wanted, which authors interested you. Ordinarily, in a situation like that, I would get Roman titles. I would get Latin titles, especially. I saw today, there were two volumes of Bede. For God's sake, that's about as late as the Loeb's go. Uh, but I didn't. When all was said and done, when I was, when I was finished shopping, I got a Greek volume. And not just any Greek volume. <laughs> I got uh, oh, you're not going to be able to make it out. Let's show you the, uh, the cover here. I got Quintus Smyrnius, The Fall of Troy, translated by Arthur Way. One of the Loeb Classical Library editions that we saw on this channel, I think a few years ago, was their new edition of The Fall of Troy. This is an epic poem, uh, much, much shorter than the Odyssey or the Iliad, in which the, ar the author, uh, Quintus, a poet named Quintus, uh, writes about the rest of what happens in the Troy story, right? You just keep in mind, the, the Troy story that we get, this is what the lobes look like. This is, they have that little signal there, and then they have the, the stuff on the spine that you're not going to be able to make out here in this lighting. Uh, the, the Iliad tells us a little more than a month in one year, late in the Greek siege of Troy. It doesn't tell us the whole story. There are flashbacks here and there, but it's nowhere near the whole story. We don't know what happens in the Iliad. We don't know what happens before much, and we don't have we have almost no idea of what happens after the events chronicled in the poem. And Quintus sort of takes that task on himself, fills it all in, probably drawing on a large amount of classical information that we don't have anymore. Homer was just one the the, the storytelling traditions that are put down in Homer were just one fraction of the whole Troy cycle. There were uh, Iliad length and Odyssey length poems about the sailing for Troy, about the, the first attack on Troy, about the first siege of a Trojan city, about uh, the life, life in Troy during the siege with barely a mention of the Greeks. There were whole epics about all of that that we don't have, they don't survive, and Quintus probably knew about them, had access to abstracts or even maybe the poems themselves. So there's a lot in here. And Arthur Way, the, the classicist who does the translating here, does a beautiful, beautiful job. Like I mentioned, a lot of Loeb translations are very choppy. They're very poor. 
they're meant, it's meant to be just, here's what the language on the other side of the page is saying. I'm not going to worry about massaging it into saying it well. This is what it's saying for you students out there. And Arthur Way managed to do that plus write it beautifully. Uh, I love his edition. I was perfectly willing to, you know, move with the times and read and, and assess the new edition. But I didn't think I would ever see a copy of this older one. And there it is. So, uh, so I grabbed it. I loved the, uh, I love the Arthur Way Quintus Smyrnia so much that I dedicated Troy War to Arthur Way. Uh, my, my novel, my novel of the Trojan War, which is not a novel of the Iliad. It's a novel of the whole Trojan War. So I was, I was, you know, cheek by jowl with Quintus Smyrna a lot in the composition of Troy War. I, I, I consulted a lot of other stuff, a lot of other allusions in, in other works of literature, but I was cheek by jowl with Quintus. And that made me very familiar with Arthur Way. <laughs> so I, I came to be have a very affectionate place in my heart for his poem, for his version of that epic. And I found it in a lobe. I left behind all of Tacitus, all of Cicero, Caesar. I left behind all of the, the Greek philosophers, Pausanias and Bede. I left behind all of that because it has been my experience that I, as much as I love the idea of the lobes, I don't use them as often as, as I want to. I don't know why that is, but I, I tend not to do it except for my very favorite authors who I don't want to read in translation. And with those authors, with those classical authors, the ones that I don't want to read in translation, I'm, I'm a fan of translations. I'm a student of them. So I, I don't view them as an imposition at all. But if I want to commune with Propertius or Horace, then I go to the Latin, but I have authoritative Latin editions that don't have any English in them. So I don't need to... I, I, I often find myself not going to lobes when I have them, so I don't have them. Uh, but somebody's going to get them. I bet somebody snaps those all up. I bet they don't, they don't... So a lot of times sets like that will undergo a kind of attrition at the brattle. I bet that doesn't happen this time. I bet somebody comes and says, well, they're a very expensive proposition to have, and I want as many of them as I can. I'm never going to find them for cheaper cost than this, especially in, you know, these are in good condition. They, they were, I believe, all of them an ex-library set, so they have little library markings. I don't know if you made that out. Uh, little library markings explaining what, what letter you file it under, what it stands for, that sort of thing, but very minimal. Uh, and then this next one, uh, a science fiction magazine. <laughs> this is Galaxy Magazine, which does Galaxy exist anymore? God, if it doesn't, somebody ought to make it exist. Uh, somebody ought to bring it back. I don't know if Galaxy does. It might be online only. But once upon a time, it was a very prosperous, square-bound science fiction magazine that had great people and got great stories. And this is uh, the issue for September of 1976. <laughs> Somebody's address label partially there. Uh, and this is just the issue for 1976. And it has... Uh, Slam bang table of contents. Uh, it has a, a, an original Vincent Tefate cover or illustration there that he just did for the inside cover. I wish it were in color. Uh, it has a whole bunch of other stuff too, though. Uh, uh, Larry Niven, Roger Zelazny. And one thing that was of real, real interest to me the books column for Galaxy back then, back when this issue came out, was being written by Spider Robinson, a science fiction author who is now entirely forgotten. Uh, who's a, uh, pulled a dirty trick on me in a, used book, in a bookstore in Boston, and then we became friends and correspondents. And he did the column, the books column, regularly for Galaxy Magazine. And in this issue, it, in honor of the fact that one of the new books that he's reviewing is a book called Children of Dune by Frank Herbert, he writes, he, he says, I went back and read Dune and Dune Messiah to get ready. And he gives critical thoughts about all three that you won't find in uh, in later studies of those books that so much reverence has been piled on those books that you forget that once upon a time they were new things on a reviewer's desk and he could see good things and bad things spider robinson praises the daylights out of all three books but he also criticizes there's lots and lots of criticism including uh, the criticism uh at the very end let me see if i can quickly find 
he summarizes his criticism of uh, Children of Dune by saying that, uh, yeah, there we go, look at the, there he is as a young man, <laughs> just hand-drawn, probably doing himself. Uh, the, uh, he criticizes Children of Dune by mainly criticizing its ending, which I don't want to give away, even though I've done a read-along of the thing and talked all about the ending. It does have an ending that does come, seems to come out of left field. And seems to leave the door wide open. He makes a great point. Uh, let's see here. Uh, tell you what. Why don't you stagger out and score a copy of the book, read it, and then tell me if you agree or not. The immediately above notwithstanding, I genuinely enjoyed reading Children of Dune right up to the last tenth or so. Enjoyed it more than I've enjoyed some of the books I've praised unreservedly in past columns. And and this is a big and, if Berkeley's PR department is under a misapprehension, if this is not the last, final, concluding book in the trilogy, my main objection falls entirely apart. Of course, we know now it isn't. It wasn't the end. God knows Herbert has left himself all the room in the world for another sequel. That's precisely my objection. In fact, as a trilogy, the Dune Cycle doesn't really get anywhere. And after all, after all that bloodshed and sacrifice, it leaves us only the apparent certainty that the human race is in for 4,000 years of benevolent tyranny under a seemingly compassionless alien. In parentheses, he writes, which is a misleading hint, by the way, so don't be mad, because he's trying not to spoil the book. That is close to true, but not explicitly true. Uh, finding out that there was a third Dune book invalidated a lot of my original objections to Dune Messiah, made rereading it much more pleasurable. A similar revelation would make Children of Dune much more palatable. I wonder if you think that's true. Those of you who know the books, I wonder if you think that's true. I read them as they were coming along, especially after Children of Dune, when I knew that I loved it. I don't remember the ending of Children of Dune particularly disappointing me. I may even have read this column at the time and thought, well, that seems a little overblown. <laughs> Doesn't that? I don't know that I agree with this criticism. And if... You do agree with it. Well, do you agree with the other point, the point that Spider didn't know when he was writing that column? Does God Emperor of Dune make the ending of Children of Dune more palatable? I found it fascinating. Uh, then this next one is a trade paperback. It's a lousy trade paperback. Uh, this is exactly the sort of thing I wanted in a UK trade paperback. I just didn't see it. And it's spurred by recent reading. I read uh, uh, Frude's book, Caesar, A Sketch, which is his biography of Julius Caesar. And I loved it. It was it was so eloquent. It was so amazing. And it's free on Project Gutenberg. And that prompted me to go and read a whole bunch of other stuff on Julius Caesar and also on the fall of the Roman Republic. And you can't read anything like that, whether it's a new book like uh, Josiah Osgood's Uncommon Wrath, or whether it's an older book, like The Last Generation of the Roman Republic, or a new copy of which I just recently found at the Brattle. You can't read any of that sort of stuff without being hip deep in Cicero. He was all over it. Wrote about it. He's our, our best, most insightful, most wide open source for a lot of it. And I, Robert Harris wrote a trilogy about Cicero that has never really worked for me. You'd think it would work more than anything else that this author has done. I love his book Pompeii. I love most of the books he writes, but his trilogy about Cicero, it's all about that change. It's exactly located in that time period, and it's never really done anything for me. And I don't know quite why. Partly, I think that I am alone of anyone who's read that trilogy and that I don't like the first book, Imperium. It's my least favorite of the three. <laughs> so I found today book two, Conspirata. Uh, I didn't see any others. I saw this in hardcover and in paperback. I got the paperback because I don't plan on keeping this. I don't imagine that this book is going to radically change my mind. But I'm right in the mood to reread this. I'm steeped in a lot of the stuff, a lot of the history works that have been written about it. So I'm right in the mood. I'm never going to be better disposed to like this book uh, than I am now. If memory serves, I mean, the whole series is narrated by Cicero's secretary, Tyro, uh, who is credited oftentimes uh, with the invention of shorthand, <laughs> As, considering how much Cicero talked, you'd pretty much need to come up with some sort of abbreviated note system, since he wanted every word he said taken down. 
Tyro appears prominently in Roman Blood, the first Stephen Saylor murder mystery in the Roma Sub Rosa series, and he is the narrator of the of these three books. He's he's the one telling the story, and this book, if I remember correctly, involves the Catiline conspiracy, and is Cicero at the peak of his powers in the Roman political system before that system started to fall apart. I'm going to give it another try. I may try it tonight and see. And if I'm more favorably inclined to it, while I'm not out of pocket anything for this, this might be an instance where I would go online and get the UK trade paperbacks of all three books and just try them all again. I know that if I want them in print format, I want them in UK trade paperbacks, not these these slick, cheap American paperbacks. I, I could even have ebooks of them and just not remember it. I don't think I do. Uh, then this next one, talk about a UK trade paperback. This is Hotter and Stony. Yes? Yeah. This is uh, Whirlwind by James Cavell. Great, big thing. Lovely thing. As soon as I saw it, I knew that I that I want... I have a sweet spot for UK trade paperbacks anyway. And I knew that I wanted this. And will I happily reread this. It will not survive. It will not survive a reread. I know that now. But this is a market departure uh, from... James Cavell, who of course is overwhelmingly famous for Shogun, that leads to the outright deception on this cover design, right? You have a gigantic red ball that's supposed to symbolize the, the, the rising sun of Tokyo, and you have a character who clearly has a gigantic samurai sword leaning on his shoulder. It's nothing like that. This is the, the Khomeini revolution in Iran, and a, a family of helicopter pilots and manufacturers. It has nothing to do with ancient Japan at all. This is just the, the publisher's desperate attempt to make, to, you know, to succeed, to woo you by association. But it doesn't have anything to do with that at all. But it, I remember it being really gripping. Maybe not a thousand pages gripping. How long is this? Anyway? I read this, uh, 1,200 pages. So war and peace territory. I read this when it first came out. And again, when was that? Boy, though, flipping through here, I'm realizing that this is... Uh, a lot steadier, sturdier than I thought. Uh, 1986. 1986. So what do the blurbs look like? Oh, look at that. All right, so there's there's a blurb from the Boston Herald. There's a blurb from the San Francisco Chronicle and from the Washington Post Book World. Uh, all loving it. Everybody loved this book. So, And it's, in, in many ways, a better subject and setting for Clavel than Shogun was. Because Clavel was this this big bluff man of the world who read, you know, ten newspapers a day and had all sorts of contacts in and out of government and was really passionately familiar with all of this stuff, not only its narrative potential as a natural storyteller, but also its news, its vital news. I will give this a try. I will hope that I that I can get all the way to the end of it without huge tufts of pages coming out. Although I think again that I have an ebook of it, which and ebooks of course are indestructible, so I don't have to worry about it. Then the other day, I got a book. What was it called? Bound to Last. I got it at the Brattle, maybe on my last trip or one before then. Just a collection of short pieces by various authors about their favorite books. And I found another book very similar to that today. This is edited by J. Peter Zane, and it is Remarkable Reads. It's uh, 34 writers and their adventures in reading. So maybe not their favorite book. But another thing, another collection of dashed off pieces by writers. Hey, uh, we need, we're doing a book section. Can you write us something about some book that really appealed to you? 800 words. I need it tomorrow. <laughs> that sort of thing. This is another collection of those. I read Bound to Last. I got it. In between, I got it, I think, a few days ago. I read it, and it had uh, exactly the effect that I was expecting, which is to make me suddenly want a lot of the books that we're being enthused about to give them another try. I mentioned I am sometimes a biddable reader. This will almost certainly have the same effect. I will certainly read some of these things and think, boy, I haven't thought about the Tripods trilogy or Ellison's Invisible Man in forever. I really should give it another try. Uh, we'll see. We'll see which where the penny drops with this. Then these next two are older, they are 100 years old, and they are incomplete. I got two volumes out of what I know is a four-volume set, and the only reason I did that is because these two were the only volumes that I saw, and it's a good idea to do that at the Brattle. If you're seeing things for a dollar a piece, and you only see two books in a series of multiple books, it's better to get them than not, because the other volumes may very well be coming. 
They might have been in a different box. They may be coming up to be priced at a different time. In, and I'm saved in this case because the volumes are independent and the two I got are really good. Uh, and that is, uh, it's these very old things here, very, very old uh, hardcovers. Let me get you a, a title page that you can actually read. This is, in this case, there, it's so old that it had this onion skin over the, uh, the illustrations. But the, uh, in one case, the onion skin pulled off. It broke off from the book. Very, very mournful. This is uh, The Romance of the Peerage. And it's by a classicist, a Scottish classicist named George Craig. So there you have, uh, uh, who is that? Uh, Walter Devereux. This is uh, volume one. I got volume one and volume two. But there are four volumes. I think volume one is almost entirely concerned with Lettuce Nolis. It was a lady in waiting and is, has a remarkably well-documented life. Yeah, this goes on forever and ever. It's all about her. This is like the best biography that could ever be found of her. They're not really differentiated. And these are in, the reason I'm sure that these were out in the sale lot is because they're in kind of crappy condition. But the binding is still solid. These I will still be able to read these. In fact, this will probably hold up a lot better than, you know, Whirlwind, which is made 100 years later. So I got volume one, which is all Let Us Know Us. And then I got also volume two. Uh, and I don't even know who's in here. I don't know uh, who we're dealing with here. Probably this is a lot of miscellaneous stuff, because that's all these things are. It's just Craig going through the records and writing up little pieces here and there for the Edinburgh Review or the Saturday Review or whatever, and then collecting them. So what are the contents here? Uh, the Percy family. The kindred of Queen Anne Boleyn. This a lady, Dorothy Devereux, gets her own profile here. Uh... Lord Grey of Wilton, Mary Tudor, the French Queen, sisters of Lady Jane Grey, Margaret Tudor, the Scottish Queen, and a long essay, the one that I know, the one that uh, that was celebrated, a long essay on Lady Arabella Stewart, who's an utterly remarkable figure. Uh, so I got two of these volumes, and they are going to, they, I don't know if Craig exists on Project Gutenberg, I should probably find out, but uh, I'm going to hope that a future visit to the Brattle, I think I'll probably, I probably have one Brattle visit in me again before the end of the year. I'm hoping that a future visit turns up the other two volumes, three and four. But these two will be fine on their own. It's not like they're, you know, you're getting 350 pages on Lettuce Nullis and then saying to be continued. <laughs> so, then this next one is a favorite of mine for a contemporary novel for the gays. Got to have something for the gays. And I've had it in trade paperbacks over and over and over again. But today I found it in a hardcover with a plastic dust jacket on it in perfect condition so i grabbed it and i'll just take the copy whatever copies on my shelf and cycle it out and this will be my copy this is an arrow's flight by mark merlis and it is the story of pyrrhus the son of achilles who in in arthur way in quintus of smyrna it, we learn the story about how it is told the pro, the fates are decree that the Trojan War cannot be won without the son of Achilles. So an embassy has to be sent back to Greece to get him when he comes to adulthood. He grows to adulthood while his father's away at war. And he is needed, and so are the arrows of Philoctetes, and so is the stealing of the Palladium, all sorts of later Homeric stuff that's in Quintus that isn't in Homer. But it was part of the ancient tradition. And Mark Merlis takes the story of Pyrrhus going to Troy and updates it and wonderfully, wonderfully plays with it. His, his Pyrrhus is uh, a go-go boy <laughs> at a club. He, he, we're told in this book that this, the one word, the total extent of his work obligations can be summed up in the single word, undress. <laughs> he undresses for the crowd and they stuff dollar bills in his, in his in his shorts you can actually see it on the cover there uh, he's leading that life and he's not all that happy about it but he certainly doesn't want to be drafted into a war and doesn't care anything about his absentee father and then greek generals show up there they have aircraft carriers instead of uh greek vessels wind-driven vessels and they want him to come to war and there's a lot about philoctetes as well and it, it's amazing Mark Merlis, I think, is really, really talented. I've loved everything that I've read by him, but nothing comes close to this. Now, maybe that's just me. I have a soft spot for this kind of subject matter, but I was very happy to find a, a hardcover with one of these protective dust jackets on it. That's great. I will I will try to resist the urge to reread. I've read, I've reread this book a couple of times in the last 10 years. I strongly recommend it, but I don't need to be rereading it. Uh, and then the, uh, the final 
book for today. This was a little bit long, but I really needed it. And I'm right. I was right. You have cheered me up. <laughs> My spirits are much better now than they were before. Uh, this final book is a trade paperback, and uh, it is a subject that I love. It's actually a book that I have read, but only out from a library. I've never actually had a copy, never seen one at the Brattle. And uh, it's also the return of a favorite character. Those of you who follow my Brattle book hauls, I don't know why, what you've done with your lives to, to make that true. But a regular character who showed up for a long time in my Brattle halls compulsively put marking stickers on dozens and dozens of pages of all the books that he had. And he must have died. Because why else? If you were that much of a, a, a control freak, you would never give up your books. He must have died. And all of those books went to the Brattle. And I saw a lot of them. There was a summer where I was just hauling a lot of them because he had really good taste in books. And I dubbed him the Tabby Cat because he had tabs all over his books. And then they stopped, which is always kind of the natural progression at the Brattle. You, you know that you're going through somebody's collection. In this case, uh, it's an old customer at the Brattle who actually puts his book plate in all of his books, so I don't have to guess. I know, I knew this person when he was alive, and I know when I'm getting one of his books, which is kind of sad, but I imagine it's going to happen to all of my books. Uh, and today, the tabby cat returned. <laughs> he returned. That's what I'm talking about. He put those tabs over in, in his books. I will take them out. My affection for him, posthumously, whoever he was, doesn't extend to sharing his mania. This is a profanation. But th this is the book. The Architecture of Charles Bullfinch. Big, lavishly illustrated thing that goes through every single thing, the buildings, the exterior, and the floor plans of every single thing that Bullfinch designed in Washington, in Boston, all of it. It's an amazing resource. I have a bunch of books on Bullfinch, but including Bullfinch's Boston, which is kind of a, a brief thumbnail classic on the subject, but this, this is the Bible on that subject. I know all of these buildings, and the ones in Boston, I've been in all of them, in all of their nooks and crannies, especially the State House. Oh my God. The, the Boston State House, perched there at the top of Boston Common. I know every nook and cranny of that building. I have been into sub-basements that even some legislators who walk in that building every day have never seen. Uh, and I also have a, I also have a sort of a carte blanche permission to use the library in the State House. I often, which is only open to members, but there are exceptions, and I'm one of those exceptions. I, for a long, long time, I used the State House because one of the State House's little secrets is that buried in the bowels of the building is a post office, perfectly functional post office, that is not members only. That it's, that would be against the law. Instead, it's just this tiny little post office that works. The, I mean, you never have to wait though. You never have to wait in line. There's never any trouble about that. It reminds me now. Uh, when I used to go, Bean and I used to go up to Vermont, visit Mark Richardson and his family. And there was a place that I used to love to go, this old, rambling, converted textile mill on a river. Bridgewater, I think was the name of the place. Uh, and in, at, at, in one of the floors up there in, that, in the rabbit warren of that building, there was a great thrift shop with lots of books. I did a bunch of hauls from there in videos in Vermont. And right in that building, just lost in all those corridors, not frequented by anybody, fully functional post office. <laughs> Same thing in the State House, but I know all of these buildings, the ones in Boston, I know all of them. I know a lot of them in DC as well. And this book is all about them, all about everything to do with the, the technical details of the architecture that Bullfinch learned almost as an autodidact. He learned, he almost taught all of it to himself. Once he was done wasting his youth, that is. <laughs> oh my. I know you all think, if, if you're thinking of Bullfinch, you're not picturing a person. You're picturing this kind of grand American, he established the American ethos for classical architecture. And you're probably thinking of that. You might be thinking of an old man, uh, an old bearded man or whatnot. But when, uh, when Charles Bullfinch was at Harvard as a boy in 1780, I don't know if there are any, I don't remember if there are any paintings of him from then, but he was quite the eyeful. He, did, he was not the stately bearded old patriarch then. <laughs> Instead, then, he was being written up for getting drunk and breaking windows. <laughs> and he was an eyeful. Uh, but he was also talented. <laughs> Let's keep our eyes on the prize. He was also talented. And this is, 
this is, I'm not going to even hope to ever find this in hardcover. I'd be perfectly happy with the trade paperback uh, once I remove the tabs. <laughs> the tabs have to go. Uh, but anyway, that was it. That was my Brattle, my Brattle book haul before the end of the world, before the world ended. The world went off a cliff as soon as I left the sale lot. Uh, it's now recovering, thanks to you. <laughs> so we'll do a Steve Pyramid. We have the architecture of Charles Bullfinch. We have An Arrow's Flight. I know I've recommended this book on this channel before. I strongly recommend it again. It is really, really good. We have two volumes of Romance of the Peerage by Craig uh, that have seen better days, but they'll live to be read again. I, and uh, I can live to hope that I, I will find the other two volumes. We have a Remarkable Reads, just a collection of book essays, type of thing I love. Uh, we have Whirlwind by James Clavell. I will be gentle with this thing in an attempt to get through it. How you people read these big paperbacks and have them in perfect condition on your channel, I don't know. Uh, with the bigger booktubers, I know they're just faking it. With a lot of you, though, I know you're reading these things. You're just so careful that your books look new even when you're finished with them. I wish I, wish I could do that. I envy it so. Uh, then we have Conspirata, Robert Harris. This is a book about uh, a, no a Roman historical novel about Cicero. An issue of Galaxy Magazine from 1976. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes. The Loeb Classical Library of uh, the Fall of Troy. Arthur Way. Boy, oh boy, that is just smile-inducing. Then we have uh, Jeeves on a Tie That Binds uh, by P.G. Woodhouse. Not sure how long that one's going to last. We have uh, Tony O'Cruiser. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Uh, we have Thomas Mann, a collection of early Thomas Mann stories. Nice collection with an introduction, so, you know, a perfect addition to that classics shelf. We have uh, Niagara by Pierre Burton, Canada's foremost historian. And we have The Adventure of the Peerless Peer. <laughs> As we started with this, we will end with this, where Holmes and Watson team up with Tarzan. <laughs> uh, I presume everybody's happy. <laughs> but anyway, this has gone on quite long enough. Thank you very much for indulging me. This was wonderful. This was exactly what I needed. No Steve stream. I don't want to push my luck. And no other videos. Just a brattle haul today. I'm sure that tomorrow will be better because I'm never leaving my house again. <laughs> Thank you, Moktoo.